Ah, what a nice cosmic family. Meet Mars. I bet you've met him before. These two little guys are Phobos and Deimos, Mars' small moons. But it seems like Mars isn't treating the little ones the right way. Phobos and Deimos are believed to be captured asteroids. However, Phobos is gradually moving closer to Mars due to gravity, and it is predicted that it will eventually be destroyed by the planet's gravity within the next 35 million years. I won't be around then. So, I imagine this will result in a ring of debris around Mars, similar to Saturn's rings. However, this process is a natural phenomenon and not an act of destruction by Mars. Apparently, Phobos is getting ripped apart by the crazy gravitational forces of the red planet. But wait, there's more! Phobos has these crazy parallel grooves all over its surface. We used to think that they were from an asteroid crash, but now scientists think they're actually from Mars's intense gravity pulling the moon apart. Talk about a rough ride! Scientists have this wild idea that when a little guy like Phobos gets too close to a big guy like Mars, it starts to stretch out towards it. They call it the tidal force. Phobos is predicted to get stretched out so much that it'll actually break apart. Crazy, right? And the debris from the moon will form a tiny ring around Mars, just like Saturn's rings. Now, some people thought that Phobos's tiger stripes were caused by tidal forces before, but that theory got shut down because the moon is just too darn fluffy. But now, these genius researchers ran some computer simulations and found out that maybe there's a hard shell underneath all that fluff that could create grooves on the surface. But don't worry. At the rate Phobos is going, it's going to crash into Mars in about 40 million years. But if tidal forces are already tearing it apart, it might not even last that long. However, we'll still have the chance to learn more about Phobos. NASA just picked 10 rock star researchers from all over the US to join the science working team for JAXA's Martian Moons Exploration, or just MMX, mission. As NASA supported participating scientists, they'll be helping JAXA explore the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos. And get this, they're even planning to land on Phobos and grab a surface sample. The mission is set to launch in 2024, and we'll get our hands on that sample in 2029. Seven of the lucky researchers will be using the MMX flight instruments to conduct their research. Phobos is a real oddball. It's only 17 miles wide and orbits Mars at a distance of 3,728 miles, to be precise. Now that's way closer than Earth's moon, which takes a whole 27 days to orbit us. But Phobos is in a death spiral toward Mars and is slowly falling towards the planet's surface at a rate of 6 feet every 100 years. But there must be a reason why Mars is acting that nastily, right? What if it's all just because of plain vengeance? Well, okay, picture this. Mars is minding its own business, being all hot and watery like a young Earth. It's got a sweet magnetic field that's protecting it from cosmic radiation and keeping its atmosphere nice and thick. Hey, life is good. But then, at least 20 asteroids, each the size of a small country, come crashing down on Mars like a giant game of cosmic whack-a-mole. One of them even leaves a crater that's almost 2,000 miles wide. Now imagine how Mars must feel with two asteroids being its moons after what other asteroids did to the red planet. All these impacts are like a massive punch to Mars's gut, and its already weak magnetic field is knocked out cold. The core gets all overheated and can't circulate properly, which means no more magnetic field to protect the planet. It's like as if you were wearing nothing at the depth of the Mariana Trench. If it were possible, you'd be defenseless and chilly. It's basically what happened to Mars. So now, poor Mars is out there in the cold, unprotected from all those nasty cosmic rays. It's like going outside without sunscreen. Not a good idea. But at least we can learn from Mars's mistakes and make sure Earth doesn't have the same fate. Maybe we should start investing in some asteroid insurance. <laughs> but trust me, the red planet isn't mean at all. It's actually pretty friendly. While Mars may seem to be pretty tough for Phobos, there's something that might be thriving with Mars's help. So get this, a team of scientists found a way to grow rice on Mars. Yep, you heard me right. 
they used MMS, not the outdated way to send pictures, but a special soil called Mojave Mars Simulant. It's supposed to mimic Martian soil. And here's the catch, Martian soil has these nasty percolate salts that can be toxic for plants. So the team grew three types of rice, one normal, and two gene-edited with mutations that make them better at handling stress, like drought or salinity. And guess what? The mutant strains were able to root in soil with one gram of percolate per kilometer. Take that, Martian soil! But hold up. The rice grown in the MMS didn't turn out as great as the ones grown in regular potting soil. So the team decided to mix a quarter of the potting soil with the Martian simulant, and looky there, the plants started developing better. Now these scientists aren't just thinking about feeding Martians. They also want to see if their findings can help grow crops in places on Earth with high salinity. And get this, the whole project started when two researchers met for coffee and decided to try growing plants together. Well, isn't that nice? I suspect you're about to say, hey, but if you want to grow rice on Mars, you have to ship insane amounts of water from Earth, and it's not easy to quench this plant's thirst. You're right. You need about 449 gallons of water to only grow a pound of rice. But guess what? Scientists made a groundbreaking announcement at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. They found a relic glacier near Mars's equator. That's right, water ice on Mars, even near the equator. This is huge news, and could mean there's even more ice just below the surface. It's not just any glacier, it's a relic glacier that's estimated to be 3.5 miles long and up to 2.5 miles wide. It's like the size of a small town. It's got all the features of a glacier, including crevasse fields and moraine bands. But get this, it's not actually ice. It's a salt deposit that formed on top of the glacier while preserving its shape. So, how did this salt deposit form? Well, it turns out that volcanic materials blanketing the region might have something to do with it. When these materials come into contact with water ice, sulfate salts may form and build up into a hardened, crusty layer. Over time, erosion removed the volcanic materials, exposing the sulfates and revealing the glacier's unique features. This glacier is young, likely from the Amazonian geologic period. That means that Mars has had surface ice in recent times. Who knows what other icy secrets Mars is hiding? But hold your horses, there's still more research to be done. Scientists need to figure out if there's still water ice preserved underneath the salt deposit, or if it has disappeared entirely. And if there is still water ice at shallow depths near the equator, that could have major implications for human exploration. Imagine being able to extract water from the ground at a warmer location. That would be a game-changer. So let's see what else these scientists uncover about our favorite red neighbor. Maybe someday, we'll even get to visit that salt glacier statue in person. See you next time! Imagine a world where the red, barren landscape of Mars is transformed into a lush and verdant garden. A world where water flows freely, carving canyons and creating lakes and oceans. Can we achieve such a world by pouring the Earth's water onto the surface of Mars? And don't rush to say no, let's explore this possibility. All right, let's say we could magically transport all of the water on Earth to Mars. This supersized game of water pong would be crazy in both engineering and logistics. So how do we even do that? First of all, we're talking about millions and millions of gallons of water, which is no small feat. We would need some really big tanks to get all this water off the Earth. We would also have to figure out how to launch it all into space. This would require some serious rocket technology, as well as a lot of fuel. We could probably create an entire fleet of spacecraft specifically designed for the task. Just imagine that! A fleet of giant water tankers packed with tons of carefully harvested water blasting off from Earth's surface and hurtling through space at unimaginable speeds. Wouldn't that be a cool sight? Now another way. Probably a better one would be to launch a large number of smaller missions over time, each carrying a smaller amount of water until enough of it has been transported to Mars. So let's say we manage to do all that. What happens next?
After we get to Mars, we'd need to distribute this water all across the planet. We could use a network of underground pipes or some special drones to transport the water to different locations. This is just some basic things, and as you can see, we already need a lot of planning and resources. Moreover, a crazy operation like this would require a massive coordinated effort from scientists, engineers, and space agencies all over the world. And let's not forget about the costs. No wonder that scientists don't really consider it a viable plan. But the scale of this operation isn't the only problem. Hypothetically, let's say that we figured all that out and poured the Earth's water on Mars. Now what? Well, believe it or not, it would be almost completely useless. Our main challenge will be the atmosphere and current climate of Mars. Mars is a dry desert with an atmosphere that's only about 1% as thick as Earth's. This means that any water poured onto the surface would quickly evaporate. It would be pretty hard to create a stable environment when the entire lake can go poosh in a matter of seconds. And if the water doesn't evaporate, then, on the contrary, it will turn into ice. Mars's surface temperature is well below freezing. Thin atmosphere only makes things worse. Another challenge is that Mars has a very weak magnetic field which means it has little protection from the solar wind. Solar wind is a stream of charged particles that are constantly flowing out from the sun. These winds are pretty dangerous. They can strip away any water that's put on the Mars surface. Also, the solar radiation on Mars is much stronger than on Earth. This would make it even more difficult to maintain any liquid water there. And finally, don't forget that we also need to purify this water to remove all the bacteria before drinking it. But let's not give up. If we stay super optimistic, we can still try to solve these problems. Basically, we need to find a way to maintain liquid water in one place for a long time and make sure that it doesn't freeze or evaporate. So how do we do it? There are a few ways we can go about it. Number 1. Insulation we could wrap all the water containers in insulation materials, like foam for example, or some reflective materials that can help to keep the water from freezing. Number 2. Heating We could use various heaters and devices to keep the temperatures above freezing, even thermal blankets. Although this would require a lot of energy and would be a difficult task. Number 3. Underground reservoirs we could dig a large hole and cover it with a transparent material to allow sunlight to pass through. This would help keep the water warm and insulated. Number 4. Salinity Adding a small amount of salt or other dissolved minerals to water can lower its freezing point. Although, we'll need much more salt for things like lakes, and this method isn't the most efficient. And finally, number 5. Building a greenhouse we could build a greenhouse or some other structure that can trap heat and create a more Earth-like environment. This option is probably the best one. After all, a greenhouse would also help us to grow various plants or other organisms. Yay, life! Alright, great. Let's say we've discovered some way to store water on Mars and keep it there in a liquid, lukewarm state. What now? What impact would this have on Mars? Actually, this would be great. If we were to pour all this water on Mars, it could have drastically changed the climate of this cold, red desert. First of all, we could create a so-called greenhouse effect. It's when gases in a planet's atmosphere trap heat, causing the planet's temperature to rise. And yeah, this is pretty bad for Earth, but for Mars, whose temperatures jump between 70 and negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be awesome. This could cause the atmosphere to thicken and lead to the melting of the polar ice caps. Wouldn't that be awesome? Mars would begin to gradually turn from a lonely desert into Earth 2.0. It also means that the planet's atmosphere will change. For example, the weather patterns. Clouds could form on Mars, rains would begin to fall. And rains, as we know, transfer water from one region to another, which would mean they could water plants if they appeared on Mars. But all of this is pure speculation. We can't be completely sure what kind of impact pouring water on the Martian surface would have on the planet's climate. Perhaps, to create this greenhouse effect, we would need much more water than what we can transport. 
But if despite all these challenges, we had succeeded with our mission and made Mars much warmer and moist, could life have been finally born there? Um, unfortunately, that would still be pretty unlikely. Yes, water is very important for creating life, but that's not all we need. The composition of the Martian soil isn't very conducive to supporting life. The soil is mostly made of minerals called regolith, which are composed mainly of dust, sand, and other materials that aren't very good for plants. Theoretically, we could terraform Mars. Terraforming is a gradual, slow change of the planet so that it becomes suitable for our life, but this would be a very complex, long, and costly process. Oh, and by the way, what would happen to our Earth after all that? We took quite a lot of water, didn't we? From Earth's perspective, transporting water to Mars would require an enormous amount of resources, including energy and different materials. And the amount of water we'd have to spend would be staggering. The loss of such a large amount of water from Earth's own reserves could have a significant impact on our planet, especially in areas where water is already scarce. So basically, this is a really bad idea, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, it may sound interesting, but it's not a viable plan at all. It would require too many resources, too much money, and it wouldn't even be worth it. That's why scientists and space agencies don't consider this idea seriously. Besides, there are many other more realistic and achievable goals in the field of Mars exploration. For example, we can keep studying the planet's geology, atmosphere, and potential for past or present life. These studies would help us to find some resources that could support future human exploration. Overall, we need to answer many more questions about Mars before we even begin to consider colonizing it. So let's keep an eye on scientific news and updates. Uh-oh. Something is nearing the surface of the planet. It looks like a fireball hurtling closer and closer at a truly incredible speed. Soon, it becomes obvious that the collision is inevitable. Bam! The impact leaves a huge crater. It evaporates thousands of cubic miles of solid rock, and it also sets off a series of terrible natural disasters. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You believe I'm talking about the catastrophic collision that occurred around 66 million years ago on Earth. You know, the one that's responsible for the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs and three-quarters of other life forms on our planet? But no, the disaster I'm talking about happened on a different planet. Scientists think that our close neighbor, Mars, once experienced the same catastrophe that struck Earth. It happened around 3.4 billion years ago. An asteroid collision might have caused a mega tsunami on the red planet, similar to the one that caused the Chicxulub impact on Earth. Scientists have identified an impact crater on Mars that was probably left by a comet or asteroid collision with the surface of the planet. Most likely, the space body landed in an ocean in the Martian northern lowlands, and the impact was so powerful that it caused a mega tsunami. Before the latest studies, the exact location of the impact crater wasn't verified. It was just a theory. To confirm it, a team of astronomers simulated a comet and asteroid collision in the area where they supposed the impact crater was. They even named this crater Paul. Paul is 68 miles across and lies in a region that is almost 400 feet below the supposed sea level. Anyway, the simulations form several craters of the same size as Paul. One of the simulations claimed that these craters had been left by a 5-mile-wide asteroid that had encountered strong ground resistance. The other simulation showed that the craters had been caused by a bit smaller asteroid that met a weaker ground resistance. But according to both simulations, the impact crater was almost 70 miles in diameter, and the collisions produced mega tsunamis up to 900 miles away from the center of the impact site. The simulations also help scientists estimate the height of the tsunami. It was about 820 feet tall, almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. The authors of the study also suggest that the Paul crater might be similar to the Chicxulub impact crater on our planet. The Chicxulub asteroid, as we now know it, is believed to come from the outer reaches of the solar system. This space body was at least 6 miles across. It crashed into the shallow seawaters near the Yucatan Peninsula. 
This splashdown was so powerful that it left its signature on the entire face of the planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega-ripples into Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. An even newer study suggests that the asteroid also triggered a tsunami so devastating it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact, and the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded, the Indian Ocean tsunami that hit Indonesia in 2004. The collision displaced so much water that it created a wave almost a mile high. That's like two Burj Khalifas, which is the tallest construction in the world, stacked one on top of the other. And, of course, all that empty space didn't stay empty for long. The ocean gushed back to fill the crater. But in the process, it only ricocheted off the crater's rim, which produced even more waves. After that, tsunami waves that were more than 33 feet tall traveled around the world at a speed of 3 feet per second, lashing at all coastlines on their way. Imagine a three-story building rushing up to you. No wonder the largest and fastest-moving waves occurred near the impact area in the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Those rose more than 330 feet tall, which is taller than the Statue of Liberty, and moved at a speed 10 times greater than more distant tsunami waves. But back to the red planet. Some experts think that not one but two mega-tsunamis could happen on Mars. They could be triggered by a pair of meteor impacts that were several millions of years apart. Between these two collisions, Mars went through a period of climate changes. As a result, liquid water on its surface turned into ice. In other words, the first asteroid impact most likely produced waves composed of liquid water. And the second tsunami was probably formed by rounded chunks of ice water. By the way, the largest asteroid to have ever crashed into Earth might not actually be the one that ended dinosaurs. A much more catastrophic collision likely happened about 3.5 billion years ago. New evidence scientists found in northwestern Australia suggests that the asteroid I'm talking about was 12 to 18 miles across. It struck Earth at an immense speed, releasing an unimaginable amount of energy. Now, this made me think. What if something like that happened these days? More than 30,000 objects that are circling Earth these days could potentially crash into our planet. NASA considers around 1,500 of them to be potentially hazardous. These space rocks are the remains left after the solar system was formed some 4.6 billion years ago. For example, in 2004, astronomers discovered a huge asteroid nearing Earth. The first observation showed that the chance of the space rock hitting our planet was less than 3%. The asteroid was named Apophis. It's more than 1,200 feet across and weighs about 20 million tons. It's supposed to streak across the sky on April 13, 2029. Apophis will pass at a distance of 19,000 miles away from Earth's surface. But even though the space rock might miss our planet in 2029, it doesn't mean it won't return 15 years later in 2036. If such an object hits our planet, the consequences will be unpredictable. They can vary from shattered glass and broken windows to most life forms getting wiped off the face of the Earth. And it'll probably affect the internet. Now that last thought is truly scary. But luckily, modern technologies are likely to help us avoid any catastrophic consequences. Experts have developed several ways to prevent a real-life disaster movie from happening. For one thing, we could use a spacecraft to knock this visitor from outer space off its course. Or it could somehow be blasted into pieces. Scientists could also slow the thing down with the help of concentrated sunlight. Or people could tug it away with a gravity tractor. That's a theoretical spacecraft that can influence objects in space without touching them. In sci-fi movies, a huge asteroid often sneaks up on Earth and turns out to be a nasty surprise to astronomers. It hurtles toward our planet at breakneck speed and gets discovered just weeks or even days before the collision. In reality, scientists are constantly watching all large objects in Earth's neighborhood. It means there would be plenty of time to do something before the inevitable happened. 
There are three kinds of missions scientists could prepare at short notice. Type 0 – when a heavy spacecraft hurdles toward the intruder with one single goal – to knock it off its course. In this case, astronomers would have to rely on the already available information. The Type 1 mission would involve a scout. It would be launched first to get more close-up information about the space rock. Only after that, the main spacecraft would be launched. With more precise information, its journey would be way more productive. And if scientists chose the Type 2 mission, they would send a scout and a small spacecraft at the same time. The spacecraft would knock the asteroid a bit off its course. Then the scout would collect all the necessary information. Based on this data, the spacecraft would finish its job with a more fine-tuned second push. If none of these methods work, people could try going deep underground or even build a shelter on the ocean floor. But in this case, we'd need to find sources of energy that could help us survive for at least several decades. Plus, people would have to create a life support system that could somehow keep air and water fresh. The soil beneath your feet is red and dry. The place is freezing cold. Rusty colored dust is floating in the air. You make one step, then another. It's hard to move because of the thick layer of dust your feet are sinking into. You're on Mars, and you've come here after hearing some absolutely incredible news. These days, the so-called red planet indeed looks dry and dusty. But scientists think that this world might have been very different a long, long time ago. They have found some evidence of a huge ocean that could have existed on the surface of Mars about 3.5 billion years ago. And this ocean probably covered hundreds of thousands of square miles. It all started with numerous satellite images of the surface of the red planet. They were snapped at different angles. As a result, researchers managed to construct a relief map of the area. They charted out more than 4,000 miles of specific formations that had most likely been carved by rivers. Those formations could also be channels, once carved out on the sea floor. Scientists used the data gathered by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2007. They analyzed the thickness of the ridges and their angles and locations. Their main goal was to explore the topographical depression called Aeolus Dorsa. It turned out that all those years ago, this part of the red planet had been undergoing a series of constant changes. They could have been caused by the rapid movement of rocks, pulled around by currents and rivers, as well as noticeable increases in sea level. Researchers also noticed a pretty clear boundary that separated the southern highlands of Mars, elevated and highly cratered, from the smooth lowlands of the planet. It looked very similar to a shoreline left by a ginormous ocean. This all likely means that in ancient times, there indeed was an ocean on the surface of Mars, and a large one at that. What's even more exciting is that the existence of such an ocean might mean the existence of life. This discovery can tell scientists a lot about the ancient climate on the red planet, as well as its evolution. We now know there had to be a period on Mars when the planet was quite warm, and its atmosphere was thick enough to keep so much liquid water. What's even more incredible, the climate in the northern hemisphere of Mars 3 billion years ago could have resembled the one we have on Earth nowadays. But then, where is this ocean now? What happened to it? Perhaps the climate of the red planet was becoming cooler, and the surface of the ocean froze. There's a theory claiming that these days, the ocean remains in its frozen state, deep under a layer of rock, debris, and dust under a northern plain called Vastitis Borealis. Or, the ocean's waters could have been lost to the atmosphere, and, eventually, space through the process of atmospheric sputtering. During this process, atoms get knocked away from the atmosphere after colliding with high-energy particles coming from the sun. Anyway, the theory of an ocean that once covered a substantial part of Mars's northern hemisphere hasn't been confirmed yet. Scientists are still arguing about its existence. As for now, Mars is a very cold world with an average temperature of negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet's surface is rocky, 
it's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. The ocean that might have existed on Mars isn't the only awesome thing about this planet. Let's speak about those sandstorms raging on the red planet. In movies, they're depicted as incredibly powerful forces of nature, destroying astronauts' camps and tearing their spaceships into pieces. But how much of it is true? Mars is indeed infamous for producing dust storms so massive they can be seen by telescopes on Earth. They sometimes cover continent-sized areas and can last for weeks at a time. But besides them, there are much rarer storms that occur once in three Mars years, which is about five and a half Earth years. Such storms are larger and much more intense than regular ones. They encircle the entire planet. That's why scientists call them global dust storms. At the same time, it's unlikely that even a global dust storm could cause serious harm to astronauts or their equipment. Even though Martian storms are massive, the wind speed reaches 60 miles per hour tops. That's less than half the speed of most hurricane force winds on Earth. Plus, this comparison of wind speeds can be kind of misleading. The atmosphere on Mars is just 1% or so as dense as the atmosphere on our planet. It means that the wind there needs to blow much faster to cause any damage or even fly a kite. Now let's move to the next amazing phenomenon spotted on the red planet. When you look at it from a distance, it looks like an eye. There are even some winding channels that look like veins running through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less the formation looks like an actual eye. It's actually a giant crater, almost 19 miles in diameter. Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other, even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the eye crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, water filled the ginormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Your next destination is Valles Marineris. That's an enormous canyon, or rather, a canyon system that runs along Mars's equator. It stretches for more than 2,500 miles. It's also four times as deep as the famous Grand Canyon on Earth. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Most scientists think that Valles Marineris is a huge tectonic crack in the crust of the red planet. It could have formed when the planet was cooling down in the distant past. Another breathtaking sight on Mars is the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which means it's almost the same size as the state of Arizona. The mountain is also 16 miles high and rimmed by incredibly tall cliffs. To imagine the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, around 2.6 miles high and 75 miles across, which actually sounds pretty impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. Scientists have been wondering for quite some time why this volcano is so large. It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason may be the red planet's crust, which is very different from Earth's. On our planet, the crust is made up of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hotspots that produce lava, new volcanoes form and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth, and the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. Now, if you visited Mars and decided to go on an evening stroll, you'd witness a strange phenomenon. It occurs on the red planet after sunset, when temperatures fall below negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. A bizarre, mysterious glow spreads across the Martian sky. Unfortunately, 
Without special equipment, you wouldn't be able to observe this soft glow. Visible only in ultraviolet light, this night glow is the result of chemical reactions that occur dozens of miles above the surface of the red planet. It seems to feel at home on any planet, we need the four crucial elements, air, water, earth, and fire. I'm going to tell you what you need to squeeze to get a glass of water on Mars, how to grow your salad there, charge your phone without getting an astronomical electricity bill, and even generate some fresh air. What if I tell you there's an ocean on Mars? Right, you won't believe me, but there used to be an ocean. Scientists believe that nearly one-third of the planet was covered with an ocean called Oceanus Borealis. Once upon a time, about 3.8 to 4.1 billion years ago, the climate on Mars was warmer and the atmosphere was denser. But over time, the climatic conditions changed dramatically and this once endless ocean simply evaporated into the atmosphere. According to estimates, only about 1% of all water evaporated, while 99% is still locked on the red planet. So, there are two sources of water now, the ice polar caps and the rocks. Ice polar caps are pretty simple to understand, as we have the very same thing on Earth, but rocks containing water. I mean, my juicer won't handle stones inside it, but let's delve into these stones just a little bit. For starters, there are at least four types of hydrous minerals on Mars. There are hydrous clays made of silicon oxygen. And the cool thing about them is that they can even contain magnesium and iron, which will come in handy once we start dwelling on Mars. Next is hydrous sulfates, which are sulfur-based. Don't ew, I know you thought of the rotten egg smell, but it's typical of hydrogen sulfide and not just sulfur. These minerals have water incorporated right into their chemical formulas. Next comes hydrous silica, which also has water locked in its formula. Carbonate salts found on Mars may not contain actual H2O, but they can only form if there's water nearby, so they just prove there used to be an ocean. But if the scientists don't come up with an idea on how to extract water from those rocks, there's a backup plan. In 2020, researchers discovered liquid water sources which may be a part of a huge network of underground saltwater lakes. So, I guess we'll find a way to stay hydrated on Mars. We can either look for those water sources better, or just invent some technologically advanced juicer to squeeze water out of those stones. The red planet may seem to us as a lifeless desert where nothing can grow. But today, it's a misconception, as there's been a couple of recent updates concerning the agricultural potential of Mars. In 2022, a group of scientists made something unbelievable they managed to grow an Earth plant on Mars. Disclaimer, it's not that they plowed Mars, watered it, added fertilizers, and patiently waited for the first sprouts to show up. They experimented on Earth, but the conditions they created were purely Martian. You see, a plant needs soil, water, food, and sunlight to grow. Food and sunlight can be created artificially, so the scientists focused on the soil and water in their experiments. There's not much Mars can offer in terms of soil, but it's rich in basalt. Plants don't fancy residing in basalt, as it doesn't have many nutrients. But still, some of them aren't that picky when it comes to soil. As we already know, water on Mars is problematic too, but it can be found in limited amounts. Still, it can't be used for agricultural needs due to its chemical composition. Long story short, it's just way too salty for any plant out there to like it. But to keep the experiment true to life, the scientists started to look for possible ways of desalinating water. Thus, they added the bacteria known as Sinecococcus, and even though the saline levels decreased dramatically, it was still not enough to satisfy the finicky plants. Luckily, the scientists had Plan B, and it worked out. They took the bacteria desalinated water and filtered it through basalt. In the end, they noticed that the resulting water was suitable for the plants. But that's just a theory. Let's see what we can actually grow on Mars. 
The scientists experimented with turnips, lettuce, radishes, and alfalfa. At first, turnips, lettuce, and radishes refused to flourish in basalt and feed on that filtered water. But then alfalfa came into play and it left the scientists stunned. The plant did really well in Martian conditions. This might seem to be the logical end of the experiment. And after all, alfalfa is pretty cool. It's rich in vitamin K. It has vitamin C, some vitamins B, zinc, and phosphorus. And you can Google a bunch of nice salads with alfalfa sprouts. But it has yet another property that may be a total game changer. Because of its deep roots, alfalfa can help fix soil nitrogen fertility. So once the scientists harvested the first Martian alfalfa, they immediately planted turnips, lettuce, and radishes back. This time, the crops did way better, and the scientists even noticed something they didn't expect. Turnip yields increased by 311%. I guess alfalfa has all the chances to become the star of Mars terraforming. Whoops, here comes the bad news. Even though you can theoretically stay hydrated on Mars and enjoy a fresh salad, at the moment, there's almost no way you can enjoy some fresh air on the red planet. Hey, you've noticed I said almost? Even though Mars's atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide, we already know how to make small amounts of oxygen there. Meet the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, but you can call it MOXIE. It's a little helper that works together with Mars rovers. This little guy can isolate oxygen on Mars and it already managed to produce 5 grams of it. It may sound like nothing, but 5 grams of oxygen equals 10 minutes of breathing. For now, MOXIE is for scientific use only, but it can actually help facilitate missions on Mars. Thing is, it's easier to produce oxygen directly on the spot than transport it from Earth to Mars. At the moment, MOXIE is not powerful enough. But once the scientists invent its descender, the air situation on Mars will change. For the fire to burn, we need one essential thing, which is oxygen. And we don't want to waste the results of MOXIE's hard work, especially if there can be alternatives. Historically, people would use fire to cook, get warm, and probably scare away some uninvited guests like saber-toothed tigers. Today, we can use electricity to cook and get warm, and no saber-toothed tiger has ever been spotted roaming the red planet. So let's see how people can generate electricity on Mars. There are quite a few options. Solar, geothermal, and wind energy can be used on Mars almost the same way we use them on Earth. Solar energy is promising, but it still won't be as effective as on Earth. Sunlight on Mars is only 43% as strong as it is in Earth's orbit. So, producing electricity this way will take more effort. Don't forget about dust storms that aren't rare on Mars. During them, the sunlight gets sorta blocked. So should we ever rely on solar energy on Mars, we must be ready for occasional electrical outages. The next problem is seasonal variations. So we could benefit from solar power for only some months of the Martian year. And, of course, no solar energy at night. Anyways, this option might work out, but it should be combined with some alternative. For instance, wind power. Wind turbines won't have any problems working during the dust storm. And they also work at night. Seems like these two sources are a perfect combo. But geothermal energy could be a cool backup plan, though. It can even work on Mars better than on Earth for a few reasons. First, the atmospheric pressure is lower on Mars, so more volumes of steam can be generated to drive the turbine. Second, Mars's surface temperature is lower and it can help too as it will increase the efficiency due to thermodynamic laws. Third, no water needed. We could use liquid carbon dioxide instead and it would work perfectly. And unlike water, liquid carbon dioxide is free. We've been dreaming about life on Mars for a long time. Not only about growing potatoes there in the future, but also about all the potatoes that could have been there in the past. Has there ever been life on Mars? Recently, scientists have found something that could be evidence of that. Let's find out what happened. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. A human hasn't set foot on Mars yet, but robots have set their wheels. The first spacecraft that visited the red planet were NASA Viking landers. They flew there back in 1976 and sent us a lot of interesting data. 
Back then, we didn't know anything about Mars. To us, it looked like a cold, lifeless desert. But since we're so similar, scientists began to wonder, has it always been like this? Or is it possible that once Mars used to be thriving and full of life? And in 2022, NASA's Mars rover Perseverance found something that could shed a light on this mystery. But first of all, what is Perseverance? Scientists have suggested that if there was life on Mars once, it's unlikely that it could simply disappear without a trace. It must have left some traces, perhaps underground, where they would be protected from radioactive solar tantrums and other nastiness. So we need to check the rocks. It's important to note that we aren't looking for life on Mars right now. There most likely isn't any. Instead, we want to look into the distant past of our twin planet. We're talking billions of years ago, when Mars could have been warm, green, and far from lifeless. In other words, we have to find dead microbes and various chemical compounds similar to ones on the Earth. This is the mission of our main character, Perseverance. It arrived on Mars in February of 2021. The spacecraft landed on the bottom of the 30-mile-wide Jezero crater, and after landing, it scooted over to the west, to the place that prompted scientists to choose Jezero for research. This place is a dried-up river delta, and this former river is already more than 3.5 billion years old. The Jezero crater itself was once a large lake. Yup, apparently there was life on Mars. And scientists have suggested that these places would be perfect as bodyguards of microbes. That's exactly what bacteria do on Earth. They hide, being still in the depths of lakes and ponds. So we could probably find traces there. The researchers believe that this particular lake has the highest scientific value in the entire mission. The highest chance to find rocks on which such bacteria could survive is here in Jezero. So Perseverance went to the delta. The row wasn't easy, though. The rover missed a little and landed further than planned. As one famous movie said, this little maneuver is going to cost us 51 years. Fortunately, Perseverance took only one year, and on the way, it was able to explore Jezero a little. The rover uses a complex built-in tool to explore the world. The tool is called Scanning Habitable Environments with Ramen and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals, or just Sherlock. Boy, NASA sure loves its acronyms. As the device approached the delta, the signal of organic molecules became stronger. Soon, these signals were everywhere, and besides, they were the brightest that the scientists have ever seen. What does it mean? Elementary, my dear Watson. You know, Sherlock. It's time to dig. Since July 2021, Perseverance has drilled and collected four thin cores of sedimentary rock. The total number of collected rocks at the moment is 12. This is the first time in history that we're collecting something like this on another planet. These four cores were found on two rocks called Skinner Ridge and Wildcat Ridge. The first pair of cores, the ones from the Skinner Ridge, don't seem very interesting at first glance. They're quite close to what we can find in many places on Earth. However, if we look at them closer, we'll see that they're dotted with round grains of some dark material. These dark grains could have once been deposited on them by an ancient river, the same one that flowed into Jezero. It's possible that the river brought them from places hundreds of miles away from Jezero. And that's pretty cool. If we study these cores, we'll be able to learn even more about the far corners of Mars. Well, there are no corners on it, but you get the idea. Then, in April 2022, Perseverance did arrive at the delta. And then scientists finally found what they were looking for. The discovery, to put it mildly, excited them. They found two more cores, which held organic substances. This pair was taken from the Wildcat Ridge. It's found very close to the Skinner Ridge, but the two rocks are quite different from each other. These samples are lighter in color and more uniform. Most likely, they're mudstone, an unusual rock similar to clay, but harder and unable to absorb water. They're also finer grain than the cores of the Skinner Ridge. Why does it matter? Because the finer the grains in the stone, the more likely it is that there may be some traces of a past life in it. On Earth, 
Fine-grained stones most often lie on the bottoms of ponds and in similar places. There, they can preserve the remains of dead organisms and similar stuff for years. And this is exactly what we found on them. Additionally, according to scientists, there was more organic matter in these two cores than in any other place studied by Perseverance so far. It probably accumulated there while the lake was gradually evaporating billions of years ago. So, there really was life on Mars? Well, let's slow down a little. Organic substances are molecules holding carbon. And yes, on Earth, they're most often associated with life, but not always. Sometimes they can form as a result of other things. Therefore, we cannot say for sure whether there was life on Mars. We don't know if these molecules really remain from some Martian microbes, or if they're the result of some other things. But the discovery is still very significant. We have to literally keep digging this way. To learn more about this organic matter, scientists need to collect a couple more samples of fine-grained rock. It would also be great to study the material lying around these former reservoirs. Perseverance has already moved to another area, to a place with a beautiful name, Enchanted Lake. Now it needs to look for similar things there. It will also continue to study Lake Jezero. Eventually, Perseverance will climb to the top of the delta and then continue exploring ancient sites outside the crater. Sometime before the end of 2022, Perseverance will probably have six or more samples of the Martian cores. Unfortunately, its tools, though complex, are quite limited. This data alone won't be enough for us to get a complete picture. Therefore, NASA plans to send other spacecraft to Jezero in the coming years. Together with the European Space Agency, they're working on the next robotic mission, known as the Mars Sample Return. The name speaks for itself. These devices will arrive and take away all the test tubes from the old Prospector Perseverance. After that, these samples will be delivered to Earth, though not by Amazon Prime, and then scientists will be able to analyze them in advanced laboratories. However, all this will take a really long time. The launch of this mission is scheduled for 2027-2028, and the spacecrafts won't be able to return until 2033. But if everything goes well, it will be the first samples in history delivered to Earth from Mars. In other words, there's still enough space for research, literally. And yes, we don't yet know the true meaning of these finds. But that's why the entire mission was created, right? And who knows? Maybe in a few years, we'll finally find out the truth about what happened on Mars billions of years ago. Ooh, check out the Martian! Made you look. Made you look. Mars is a dry, rocky, and barren planet. It's difficult to imagine that, once upon a time, the red planet could have had a landscape similar to ours. But scientists believe that this is the case and that millions of years ago, Mars was filled with vast oceans of water. In early 2021, NASA sent their most advanced rover yet to the Red Planet. Its mission is to search for any signs of microbial life that hint at the planet's past. They named the rover Perseverance, or Percy for short. Even Percy's initial landing on Mars itself was a scientific discovery. The rover landed using auto-navigation along with onboard cameras to track the planet's surface and find the ideal spot to land. This helped scientists work out the best landing options for future missions to Mars. Percy currently roams the red planet, guided by a new and highly advanced auto-navigational system. The majority of his day is spent analyzing rock formations. Percy is decked out with a high-tech laser that fires a tiny pinpoint beam into rocks. The laser creates a plasma from the rock samples. Then Percy's onboard spectrograph analyzes the plasma to identify the chemical composition of the rock. Two of Percy's most significant findings so far are rocks that have been nicknamed Mazi and Yigo. These words come from the Navajo dialect, in tribute to a NASA engineer from the Native American Navajo tribe. Mazi means Mars, and Yigo means diligent. These two rocks are both salt-like in composition, meaning they are igneous rocks. If you're not familiar with your rock species, igneous means that the rocks were formed from a volcanic eruption. 
The current shape of Mazi and Yigo suggests that they have been molded by a watery environment. This could be proof that Mars was once filled with water. Another interesting rock discovered has been nicknamed the Harbor Seal. This is a dark, smooth rock that scientists believe had been sculpted by powerful northwesterly winds to resemble the playful marine animal. For decades, scientists have theorized about the wind and weather patterns on Mars. This finding seems to support their existing weather modeling of the planet. Perseus sent back over 20,000 images since arriving on Mars in February, including an internet-breaking selfie. Audio files have also been sent from the Mars mission. For the first time ever, we can listen in to the eerily and ambient sounds of extraterrestrial winds on the Martian landscape, all thanks to the rover's onboard microphones. For the first time ever, oxygen has been produced using human technology on another planet. Inside Percy is a gold-plated box around the same size as a car battery. This is the MOXIE unit. MOXIE stands for Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. Yeah, that's a bit of a mouthful. 95% of Mars' atmosphere consists of carbon dioxide. The MOXIE unit diffuses the carbon dioxide and, through an intricate chemical process, turns it into oxygen. The unit has produced a modest but still historic 5 grams of oxygen. This works out to around 10 minutes of breathable air. It's also a good sign for what could come in the future. Who knows? Maybe one day, MOXIE can produce enough oxygen to support a human colony on Mars. For now, scientists are more focused on MOXIE producing enough oxygen to create rocket fuel. In order to propel the standard-sized modern-day spacecraft off of Mars, you would need 7 metric tons of rocket fuel and 25 metric tons of oxygen. This would be far too heavy for a spacecraft to bring from Earth. So if there is ever to be a manned mission to and from Mars, there needs to be some way to create fuel on the planet. For those of you worried about Percy being lonely, he actually has a special companion up there with him. Stowed inside the rover on his descent to Mars was a small but expensive helicopter named Ingenuity. But you can call her Ginny for short. The mini-helicopter cost NASA $80 million to develop. But every penny was worth it as Ginny made history by performing the first powered drone flight on another world. Ginny was a massive scientific feat, as engineers originally struggled to design a helicopter dinky enough to be stowed on an interplanetary rover, but powerful enough to take flight on another planet. After the success of Ginny, scientists are now collecting data from the one-of-a-kind helicopter to aid in the design of smart micro-drones here on Earth. The helicopter is used to explore terrain that is unsuitable for the rover. Ginny hovers over the Martian landscape, collecting data and taking aerial photographs to send back to Earth. Ginny is powered by solar panels above the rotor blades. A big concern for scientists was that the panels would get covered in thick coatings of Martian dust and leave the helicopter powerless. Luckily, airflow from the blades actually self-cleans Ginny's solar panels. Inside her mechanisms, Ginny carries a small postage stamp-sized piece of fabric from the Wright Brothers' historic 1903 flying airplane. This is a loving tribute to the original pioneers of aviation. The Curiosity rover first landed on Mars back in 2012 and has been roaming the red planet for over 12 years. Curiosity wasn't designed to detect life as Perseverance was, but instead to determine if Mars had any of the necessary elements that could sustain life. This includes things such as liquid water, carbon, energy sources, Curiosity found a site scientists called Yellowknife Bay. This site once contained an ancient lake. The rover discovered minerals left behind from the waters, showing that the lake water was not too acidic or too salty. It would have had a balanced pH. Carbon, nitrogen, and other elements that could potentially support life were all found within the crater of the ancient lake. And most important of all, Curiosity found potential sources of energy for microbial life. So, maybe there could be existing life on Mars after all. Curiosity made history by being the first Mars rover to witness and measure a planetary-wide dust storm. Just like on Earth, wind constantly blows on Mars, grinding away at the geology. This creates lots of dust, which eventually gets whipped up into large clouds. The dust clouds absorb sunlight and heat up, making the winds more intense. 
Without any rain or oceans, every few years the clouds grow so large that they wrap around the entire planet and create a giant dust storm. In 2018, Curiosity witnessed one of these great storms from the Martian surface. It noted that sunlight on the planet decreased by 97%, and many large sand dunes were left behind. Curiosity has spent more than a decade measuring the radiation environment on Mars. This allows scientists to work out if humans could safely visit the red planet without turning radioactive. So far, the news is encouraging, and the Mars radiation levels are comparable to those experienced by astronauts aboard the International Space Station. This means that astronauts could endure a long-term round trip without having to worry about radiation too much. Mars is home to the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. This giant volcano is 14 miles high. That's about two and a half times the size of Mount Everest. The volcano was formed millions of years ago, a time when Mars was filled with countless volcanoes spewing molten lava across the planet's surface. Olympus Mons is a shield volcano, so rather than violently spewing lava and flames up into the air, lava would flow slowly down the sides of the volcano. This gives it its low, squat appearance and an average slope of only 5%. At only a few million years old, Olympus Mons is still a fairly young volcano. Because of this, scientists believe that it could potentially still be active. So maybe it could erupt at some point in the future. The Curiosity rover doesn't just eye up the local geology, it also takes a note of what's happening in the sky. In March 2021, it captured these shimmering iridescent colors in the sky, named Mother of Pearl Clouds. This colorful display occurs when all the cloud particles are nearly identical in size. It usually happens shortly after the clouds have formed. Millions of people around the world go out on the streets and rooftops to look at the amazing cosmic phenomenon. Another planet right next to the moon, a big red one. At first, everyone's excited. Mars showing up out of nowhere is having a strange effect on humanity. Just as the moon can affect the psychological and physical state of some people, Mars's unexpected visit is causing people to behave pretty strangely. Every night, the sky is lit up by the white light of the moon and the red glow of Mars. Many people get a sort of instant insomnia. Some even stop drinking coffee because they no longer feel sleepy. Mars brings out energy and a little wildness in people, <laughs> making them laugh more, and even drives a few poor people crazy. They begin to go out of their houses more often and enjoy the unusual night sky. A few days later, Everybody can see what's happening. Mars is getting bigger. Scientists announced that the red planet is slowly moving towards Earth. A collision is inevitable. Earthlings only have a few years left. A few months ago, a huge asteroid crashed into the red planet with such force that Mars simply flew out of its own orbit and went rogue. The chance that Mars would fly close to Earth was always going to be pretty high. After about three seconds of being announced, the news went viral, and panic set in. The situation's getting worse and worse. The closer Mars gets, the more it affects people on a physical level. Hundreds of videos pop up showing collision simulations of Mars and Earth. And there's no happy ending. Want to see what happens? One famous blogger asks her followers. The Earth's almost completely covered with water, and Mars is all dust, sand, and rocks. Then she puts a huge watermelon in the middle of her room. From the far end, she launches a bowling ball at it. Strike! Mars looks almost the same size as the Moon now. It's about to come into the Moon's orbit, and it's affecting the Earth's magnetic field. Floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, powerful thunderstorms – they go from bad to worse. Animals go crazy. Birds no longer migrate south the polar northern lights appear in the Caribbean. The economy isn't handling the news that well. People stop showing up to work. Why wouldn't they? They just want to have fun and be with loved ones. There are enough resources on the planet to last until the catastrophe, so no one's even trying to fix the Earth's problems. Clothing, food, cars, yachts, whatever – everything loses its value and becomes free. 
Every day, huge street parties pop up all over the world. People decide to live their last months in peace and harmony. The global catastrophes uniting humanity like never before. To go out with a bang, Earthlings team up to organize a huge rock concert. The red giant destroying our beautiful blue planet. Yeah, rock and roll's the perfect soundtrack. There's just enough time to eat, dance, party, and listen to good music. Huge stages are built all over the planet. It's every musician's last concert. During all that preparation, hope suddenly appears. Scientists have calculated all the events that'll occur when Mars crashes into Earth, and they have a simple plan. Luckily, humans had already planned on moving to Mars, so they already have been building spaceships for years. There's no time to get to another planet before the collision. But the good news is that people can wait out the disaster just outside Earth's orbit. You get to sit in a space station, munch some popcorn, relax, and enjoy the show. When the dust settles, it might just be possible to return to Earth, or what's left of it. After learning about this plan, people start working on finishing the ships night and day. Everyone in the world pitches in. There are still two years left before the big day. The huge concert stages are converted into more space stations. Mars is now giving people more energy, and with epic teamwork, people manage to create thousands of stations in just a few months. That's what happens when 7 billion people work together. Farmers, physical therapists, chefs, engineers, athletes, accountants, all on the same team. Mars is now closer to us than the Moon. The red giant blocks out the sun, and our planet is plunged into darkness. There are only a few days left. People are working like ants in a massive colony, putting the finishing touches on several hundred thousand space stations. It takes four whole days for everyone to get on board. Plus, there's the loading of supplies. Animals, fish, seeds, plants, vegetables, fruits, video games, fruit roll-ups. The red giant is scheduled to enter Earth's orbit in a couple of days. That's when it will really pick up speed. Mars is only a little more than half the size of Earth, but up in the sky, it looks infinitely huge. The ships start taking off. People take a last look around, memorizing every inch. In a few hours, it'll all change forever. The stations fly up far enough away to clear any orbits. Two worlds colliding together should still have a soundtrack, though. Rock stars on every ship organize an outer space music festival. To the awesome sound of rock, Mars enters Earth's atmosphere and burns a thin layer of its own surface. This releases an incredible amount of energy. It gets faster and faster and smashes into the Pacific Ocean. A huge blast wave sweeps across the entire planet. Everything is lit up by flames, and everyone on the ships has to put on sunglasses to avoid being blinded. Our blue planet is turning into a fiery one. The dust of Mars mixes with the water of Earth. The force of the impact goes through the Earth's crust into the liquid-hot magma. Hundreds of pieces of Mars, some the size of entire countries, are somehow floating in the atmosphere. The collision generates so much energy that all oceans boil and evaporate. Seas and rivers of molten metal are now spreading all over Earth. Days, weeks, months pass. A belt made up of bits of Mars forms around the Earth. It's like a fiery version of Saturn. It'll take a long time before it's safe to land back down. But humanity can't stay alive on the ships all that time. Food, water, and oxygen will run out after a few years. But scientists already have a plan. The ships flip a switch and become huge cryo chambers. The ships are equipped with energy panels, and the roasting hot Earth's giving off a lot of energy. Totally enough to keep the ships working while everyone on board takes a few thousand year nap. As soon as the planet cools down, humans will wake up. Hundreds of thousands of years pass. One day, alarms go off simultaneously on all the ships. People wake up, slowly. Their bodies are exhausted, but after a few billion cups of coffee, everyone's ready to go. Down on Earth, new continents should have formed, and the atmosphere is most likely way different. The planet might have lost its original orbit, so it might be spinning at a different angle. The seasons as we know them, gone. 
All the water on Earth evaporated in the first few hours. But there were huge glaciers on Mars, which might have melted on impact. Mars may have shared its water with our planet. The clouds of dust and dirt should have settled by now, and the ground should be pretty good for growing stuff on. All that magma probably spewed up a bunch of useful minerals and chemicals. It's going to be difficult, but humanity somehow must adapt to the new Earth. People are ready for anything. All the Earthlings run to the nearest windows to see what their beloved planet looks like after all these centuries. Um, where is it? People are craning their necks, looking out at the empty spot where the Earth used to be. The impact of Mars was so strong that it pushed the Earth out of its orbit around the Sun. It's gone. Great. What are we going to do now? Some bearded guy grabs a guitar and says, let's play! Recently, scientists have made an astounding discovery that can change the entire course of Mars' exploration. Apparently, there are oceans of liquid water on the red planet. So, the future looks bright. We could use this water to support future missions, and then even relocate to Mars since we wouldn't need to worry about where to get this precious liquid, right? Well, there's one big problem. These oceans of liquid water are in Mars, so deep inside that we aren't likely to get there. At least that's what a new analysis of seismic data collected by the Mars Inside Lander claims. Huge reserves of liquid water seem to be the best explanation for some seismic quirks of the red planet. So all this precious water is out of our reach. But we need to find it to solve the puzzle of the aquatic history of our blushing, dusty neighbor. And the first thing we need to do is identify where the water is and how much of it the planet is hiding. Navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Now, our rovers are scurrying about on the surface of the red planet, gathering all the available data on the planet's surface geology. And it's getting increasingly obvious that Mars was once covered with water. Many factors, from Martian terrains to ancient dry lake beds and deltas, suggest that there was a time when the planet was quite soppy. These days, there's still some water on and right below the surface of Mars, but it's in the form of ice and nowhere near what Mars had in the ancient past. To understand how much of it could have been on the red planet billions of years ago, we must know where all this water went. There are two spots where the water could have gone – into space or toward the interior of Mars. Then it could have been isolated as either liquid reservoirs or ice deposits. Currently, we don't have any way of measuring how much water once leaked away. But now, we finally can find out more about the gooey center of the red planet. All thanks to the Mars InSight lander. It isn't operating anymore. But from November 2018 to December 2022, it was listening to the hums and rumbles and monitoring the activity below its feet. The thing is, acoustic waves generated by seismic activity deep inside the planet can change according to the composition and density of the material these waves are moving through. And scientists can get a lot of information analyzing the behavior of seismic waves. In this case, they used a model similar to those used to map underground oil fields and aquifers on our home planet. Then, with the help of this model, they analyzed the data gathered by InSight on Mars. They discovered that the best explanation could be that there was a layer of fractured rocks whose cracks were filled with water deep under the surface of the red planet. That layer could be at a depth of 7 to 12 miles. That's why it would be extremely tricky for future missions to get to it. And still, the new discovery could help us understand the Martian water cycle. Confirming the existence of a large reservoir of liquid water can help us sneak a peek at what the climate on Mars used to be or what it could be like one day. And if once Mars had a lot of water, it could have been habitable in the ancient past and might become habitable in the future. Water is crucial for life as we know it, so underground water reservoirs on the red planet could already be habitable. Maybe while we're talking, tiny microorganisms or even some tentacled creatures are living their lives in the comfort of their underground home. On Earth, super-deep mines do host life. 
And the bottom of the ocean, with its immense unbelievable pressures, isn't lifeless either. So far, we haven't found any evidence of life on Mars. But for now, it sounds like this place has the potential to sustain life. InSight data has shown that there isn't likely to be a lot of water ice in the upper crust of the planet, at least in the region around the lander. But if it turns out that there is a water-rich layer deep below the surface and stretching around the entire globe of the planet, then there would be enough water to fill ancient ocean beds and even more. Now Mars isn't the only place outside Earth where there is water or where we might one day find water. Take the good old Moon, for example. On Earth's natural satellite, water can be found all over the surface, but it's not the water you might be imagining. On the Moon, water remains mostly as ice, and it's distributed unevenly. For example, the poles of the Moon are the regions that never receive sunlight. This is the reason they're extremely cold, and it's no wonder there's a lot of ice there. The ice in these areas is often mixed with the lunar soil and hiding deep below the surface. Then there's Enceladus, the sixth largest moon of Saturn. In reality, it's not that large, just 314 miles across. In other words, this moon is small enough to fit inside Arizona. Ooh, we should try that! Well, interestingly, when the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, researchers were expecting Enceladus to be a frozen ball of ice. But what they saw was plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the moon's surface. It was clear that there was a massive ocean between the moon's rocky core and its icy shell. Then there's Jupiter's moon Europa. Scientists think that this world is one of the most promising places in the solar system when it comes to searching for new life forms. That's because Europa has a huge saltwater ocean as deep as 40 to 100 miles. And even though it's under a layer of ice that is likely to be 10 to 20 miles thick, it's still potentially habitable. Astronomers believe that plumes of water might erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the Moon's ocean into space. The temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa, and astronomers aren't sure yet how the ice behaves there. That's the main reason they haven't figured out yet how deep or large the water reservoirs on Europa are and how long they need to refreeze. But out of all the places where we could find water in the universe, the most bizarre is probably open space. In 2011, two teams of astronomers discovered a cloud of water floating freely among stars. It was the largest and farthest reservoir of water ever detected. So this massive cloud of water vapor surrounds a black hole. But not just any black hole. This one's a quasar, located 12 billion light-years from Earth. The conditions around this quasar must be really special to create such an enormous amount of water. This cloud contains 140 trillion times the volume of all the water on Earth. That's enough to give every person on the planet a whole planet's worth of water 20,000 times over. Sounds wild, doesn't it? But there's something even cooler. Astronomers think this water cloud formed just 1.6 billion years after the universe began. This discovery is yet another sign that water has been around all over the universe, even in its early days. But here's the kicker. Until they found this, scientists had never detected water vapor so far back in time. Sure, there's water in our Milky Way galaxy, but most of it's frozen solid in ice. This discovery really pushes the boundaries of what we know about water in the universe. There are tons of weird things on Mars. Spoons, noodles, doors, even faces. Are they all really just rocks? Besides, it's not the only planet in our solar system full of mysterious things. Let's check them out. Recently, we found a strange thing on Mars that looks like a smooth, spoon-like object. It grabbed everyone's attention after NASA's Curiosity rover spotted it. The rock, with a handle and rounded tip, looks like it's floating in the rover's photo. People on the internet are puzzled about what it might be. Some are joking that it's a Martian's bowling pin, or even a shoehorn left by extraterrestrial creatures. But Andrew Good from NASA says it's not that exciting. Turns out it's just a rock shaped by the wind over a long time. These kinds of rocks with odd shapes are common on Mars. 
They're called ventifacts. Ventifact is a rock that can get scratched, dented, or smoothed out by tiny particles carried by the wind. You'll usually find these kinds of rocks in dry places where there's not much grass or trees to block the wind, and where there's a lot of sand blowing around. Sometimes, the wind can carve ventifacts into really cool shapes, like the mushroom rocks you can see in the White Desert National Park in Egypt. These rocks look like giant mushrooms because the wind wears away the bottom part faster than the top, making them stand tall and slim. Ventifacts aren't the only cool Martian rocks. Check out this series of surreal spikes protruding from the red surface. NASA's Curiosity rover stumbled upon them while exploring the Gale Crater on Mars. They quickly caught everyone's attention. Twisting structures resembling spikes looked like some extraterrestrial doors. Even the SETI Institute, an organization focused on searching for extraterrestrial life, tweeted about the image, referring to it as a cool rock. But in reality, these are just hoodoos. These tall and thin spires occur when hard rock sits atop softer rock layers. Martian spikes are likely cemented fillings of ancient fractures in sedimentary rock, with softer material eroded away over time. Again, there are many hoodoos on Earth, too. They're also called fairy chimneys or tent rocks. You can find them in places like Utah's Bryce Canyon and the Colorado Plateau. NASA is excited about these weird structures because they can help us learn more about the history of the Gale Crater. There was also a rock that looked like a jelly donut. We call this rock Pinnacle Island. It was spotted by NASA's cameras. However, just four days earlier, it was nowhere to be seen. So how did it magically disappear? In a very anticlimactic way, it was kicked up by one of Opportunity's wheels as it traversed the Martian terrain. But there's still some mystery surrounding that jelly donut. Analysis revealed that Pinnacle Island contains unusually high levels of sulfur and manganese. Both of these things are water-soluble. In other words, there might have been some water action that created these elements in the rock. So this tiny thing suddenly caused a lot of drama, and an entire lawsuit against NASA. It claimed that the agency failed to investigate a possible fungus growing on Mars. Mmm, jelly donut fungus. But not all our findings are natural. Another puzzling discovery was this thing the Perseverance rover spotted. It's something that looks like tangled spaghetti or a string. Just like the donut, this mysterious object showed up in a rover camera image and then vanished from the sandy ground in several days. It turns out that it could be debris from the rover's landing system. Perseverance landed in the Jezero crater in February 2021. It had a rough landing and accidentally scattered debris around. Some of these debris pieces have been showing up in the rover's images for a while now. The string-like object is likely a piece of shredded Dacron netting, which is a type of fiber used in thermal blankets. These blankets help regulate equipment temperatures during the super hot process of landing on Mars. It probably underwent significant unraveling and shredding due to strong forces during the landing. Thermal blankets lost a bunch of stuff back then. For example, this shiny foil piece spotted in June. The rover found it on a rock. What's remarkable is how far some of the debris has traveled. The rover landed about 1.2 miles away from where it's currently exploring. It's probably because the crash threw the debris into the air, and the Martian winds carried it over such a distance. Mars is known for its strong winds, which can move lightweight objects. However, while it's fun to stumble upon them on images, there are concerns about the debris and trash on Mars. We haven't even fixed this problem on Earth, and we're already creating it on Mars. The debris we left on the Red Planet is already accumulating in an area called Hogwallow Flats. Plus, the debris can accidentally contaminate the sample tubes used for collecting Martian rocks. So far, NASA isn't overly worried about this, but they're keeping a close eye on it to prevent any issues with the rovers. Now, how about not things, but animals? Curiosity caused quite a stir when it captured something that looked like a rat on Mars. 
Some started speculating that it could be evidence of indigenous Martian life, or even that this rodent was brought along by curiosity. But the Mars rat, once again, turned out to be just a weird rock. It looked interesting because of the natural processes like wind erosion and mechanical abrasion. We also found some worm-looking things. Curiosity snapped a picture of a formation that looks like worms wriggling across the Martian landscape. Despite its tiny size, this formation stands out with its unique shape and rough texture. It's probably made of durable material resistant to Mars's harsh erosion. And finally, our top mysterious finding is the face on Mars. Sidonia is a region on Mars that has captured both scientific and popular interest. It's located in Mars's northern hemisphere. It lies between heavily cratered regions to the south and relatively smooth plains to the north. There's a theory that the northern plains may have once been ocean beds. Maybe Sidonia was once a coastal zone. This place is full of interesting and beautiful features that tell us a lot about the history of the Red Planet. But its most interesting feature was the Martian face. This thing gained widespread attention when it was snapped by the Viking 1 orbiter in 1976. Some believe that it was evidence of a long-lost Martian civilization. At first, NASA dismissed it as a trick of light and shadow. But after some analysis, it turned out to be... Yep, another rock. We also saw a face of a bear. It was captured by the high-resolution imaging experiment camera. In an image, we can see a circular fracture pattern that looks like a bear's head, with two craters forming the eyes and a V-shaped collapse structure like the nose. The head likely formed because something heavy settled on top of an old hole in the ground. This hole was filled with either lava or mud. The nose-like feature is speculated to be a volcanic or mud vent. But why do we keep seeing these strange things on Mars? Sometimes our brains can trick us into seeing things like faces or objects and rocks and other things. But these are just illusions called periodolia. Periodolia is a psychological phenomenon that makes us see familiar patterns or shapes, especially faces, where none actually exist. It's because the brain encounters something it doesn't recognize or understand right away. It tries to find things that look the most like this one. So it sees random patterns, textures, or sounds as something meaningful and recognizable. That's why a chair and clothes on it seems like a super creepy human-like figure at night. It also causes you to see faces or shapes in clouds, or hear recognizable sounds and even words in random noise. It's a fascinating proof of the power of our perception, but we also should be careful with it and not let our imagination run wild. Of all the creatures on our home planet, this could be the only animal that could survive harsh conditions on Mars, the tardigrade. These fellas have another name because of their unusual looks, water bears or moss piglets. They live literally everywhere across the globe from coastal dunes to mountains, from the lush Amazon rainforests to the barren landscapes of Antarctica. Some live on land, but tardigrades are creatures that need water around their bodies to enable gas exchange and generally stay hydrated. That's why they prefer soil, moss, or leaves covered with a layer of water. And since they're aquatic creatures, they usually choose freshwater bodies like lakes, rivers, and ponds. You haven't come across these cool animals before because they're only 0.02 inches long. You can barely perceive them with the unaided eye. But since they're virtually immortal, we can assume they've developed some amazing survival tactics. If we loaded them in a tiny spaceship and sent them to Mars, they'd be a little shocked at first, especially because of the temperature. Sure, they can live through a wide range, even going below minus 458 degrees Fahrenheit and up to 302 degrees Fahrenheit. And Mars might seem like a very hot planet when you see it in pictures, but the temperatures there are actually low, way lower than on Earth. I mean, it's farther from the sun and has a thin atmosphere, so temperatures there can drop to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit or go up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
On Earth, the lowest temperature was recorded in Antarctica. It was minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit, while the highest occurred in California, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Tardigrades are also pretty resilient when it comes to strong pressure. They can take one that's six times bigger than the pressure at the bottom of the ocean. Now, for every 33 feet you go down below the surface, the pressure doubles. So, at a depth of 2.4 miles, the pressure is 380 times greater than at the surface. And in the very deepest parts of the ocean, it can be 1,100 times greater. The pressure on the red planet is about six times stronger than in the ocean depths. So, I guess it's a little bit too much. It would be hard for these little creatures to adjust to such conditions. They would have to evolve through the next few generations to become even more resilient so that they could enjoy their time on Mars more. The food could be one of their main problems, though. Some tardigrades mostly eat plants like moss, algae, or some flowering ones, and they like them served with a portion of bacteria. Others are carnivores that eat smaller tardigrades or other microscopic organisms. Well, they'd find nothing like this on Mars. So I guess we'd have to fill their tiny spaceships with lots of stashes of food they would be able to pull inside their tubular mouths. Now we're getting to the really tricky part, water. The red planet is a dry and dusty desert today. But come on, look at all those riverbanks and dried up deltas. Water must have flowed on its surface a long time ago. It's hard to understand where it all went, but it's highly possible most of the ancient water ended up trapped within minerals on the planet's crust. Some older research suggested that most of this water had escaped into space when the sun's radiation had ruined the atmosphere of Mars. But a new study has shown that only a little bit of water escaped while most of it is still there, hidden and waiting for us to discover it. Also, a few years ago, researchers found signs of hydrated minerals on the slopes of the red planet, where they saw mysterious darkish streaks that seemed to flow. It mostly happens during warm seasons, since they fade when it gets cooler. These downhill flows could be evidence of real liquid water on Mars. Scientists have discovered some minerals that confirm this idea too. These minerals can lower the freezing point of water like salt does on icy roads. That's why scientists think there might be a shallow underground flow of briny water that causes these streaks. Tardigrades probably have excellent instincts, considering they can survive even in the toughest conditions. So they'd probably find water on Mars way before us. But even if they didn't do it right away, they would still have their tactics to stay alive for a while. If this creature loses 99% of its water content, it can survive by pausing most of its vital functions. It can remain in such a state for a couple of years. Tardigrades can absorb extremely strong impacts that would easily crush other animals, including us. They can withstand radiation levels so high that they could destroy a human. And even if we do send tardigrades to Mars one day, that won't be their first trip to space. In 2019, a spacecraft went to the moon, carrying thousands of tardigrades, the first lunar library, human DNA samples, and a DVD-sized archive that contained 30 million pages of information. The idea was to create archives of all the knowledge the human race had collected. But seconds before the spacecraft had to land, the mission control lost contact with it, and it crashed into the surface of the moon. The team was wondering what was going to happen with the spacecraft's cargo. After lots of discussion and analysis, they assumed that the library had survived, and even crazier, perhaps tardigrades had too. They were in this dehydrated kind of dormant state, so they shriveled up into tiny balls. They lowered their metabolism and expelled most of the water from their bodies, waiting for a better environment where they could be their best selves once again. These creatures can stay like this for decades and survive extremely harsh conditions. And this wasn't the first organized tour to space for tardigrades. In 2007, a team of scientists sent a group of these tiny water bears to orbit our home planet on the outside of a rocket for 10 days. They did pretty well, considering that when the rocket got back to Earth, 68% of these creatures were alive. Scientists don't put all their hopes only on these water bears. They keep testing if there are some other life forms that could survive on the red planet. They did an experiment called Biomex on the International Space Station. 
They took tiny organisms such as algae, bacteria, and other similar creatures and kept exposing them to really tough conditions in space for 18 months. This means things like huge changes in temperature, extreme radiation, and vacuum. The amazing part is that many of these tiny life forms survived these harsh conditions and came back to Earth as true space heroes. So they could probably deal with the hardships of living on Mars. Scientists studied archaea as well. Those are tiny, ancient microorganisms that have existed in salty seawater on our planet for more than three and a half billion years. Some of their relatives from the Arctic also survived in space-like conditions. But life on Mars doesn't have to be a whole new thing. Billions of years ago, the red planet might have been a bit like Earth. It most likely had water, and that's one of the key ingredients for life. Scientists believe tiny organisms called methanogens might have thrived there. They were hiding beneath the surface to stay safe from harsh radiation. These organisms could have breathed in hydrogen and carbon dioxide, exhaling methane gas. But as they gobbled up hydrogen, which was a powerful greenhouse gas back then, they might have cooled the planet too much. So it's possible these ancient microbes are still somewhere there, trapped in ice deep below the surface. They could be in a sort of deep sleep, waiting for better conditions to wake up, or some new cool friends from Earth. How do you prepare for a long trip? You probably look up the route on Google Maps or watch a walkthrough on YouTube. Or maybe you ask someone who's been there recently. But what if you're bound for a place humans have never existed? Yes, I'm talking about our next door neighbor, the Red Planet. NASA is planning a mission to Mars in the late 2030s or early 2040s. That's too far in the future. So why start preparing now? Well, it's closer than you think. Rookie astronauts spend at least two years training just to go out in space. For every hour they spend in space, they need to spend 10 hours underwater on Earth. This training only applies to spacewalks and the International Space Station. So far, some 600 people have been to space, but humans have never set foot on Mars. Traveling to this planet will require a different kind of training. Is there a region of Earth that closely resembles Mars? The Apollo mission's astronauts trained in Nevada. This is where Neil Armstrong and his fellow astronauts got a sense of what the surface of the Moon would feel like. But Mars is different from the Moon. It has gravity and an atmosphere. In this aspect, it resembles our own planet. Just one country, to be more precise. Iceland. NASA used this island in the far north of Europe as a testing ground for its 2020 Mars mission. And no, the mission didn't involve humans landing on the red planet. Just a small rover looking for signs of life. But the high-tech robot still needs some practice. Let's do a little test of our own. Compare the landscapes on Mars and Iceland. Are you struggling to spot the difference? Good, that means that scientists have picked the ideal training grounds for the upcoming Mars mission. An area entirely barren and devoid of life. That's how one researcher involved in the mission described Iceland. And this description perfectly matches the conditions future astronauts will encounter on Mars. But what's so special about Iceland? There are valleys that were created by volcanic eruptions. The island is still young in geological terms. Simply put, it's still forming. Lava flows, water, volcanoes, raging winds. Iceland has it all. The country's slogan is the land of fire and ice. The island's population is just above 350,000. For comparison, the city of Cleveland in Ohio has more residents than the entire country of Iceland. But the size doesn't always matter. Remember Euro 2016? When England lost to Iceland 2-1, their players became stars overnight. But Icelanders are closer to the stars than you think. The country has a space agency. Yeah, you heard it correctly. Now, this agency actually consists of two people who are trying to promote Iceland as a terrestrial analog to Mars. In short, this means that Iceland looks a lot like the Red Planet. The local duo wants to get space scientists to choose Iceland as a training ground for future astronauts. Their biggest argument is that it's cheaper. Sending people and equipment into space is expensive. Duh! 
According to Elon Musk, SpaceX launches cost around $2 million. That's way less than a typical NASA launch. A large portion of space research takes place back on Earth. Antarctica is ideal for studying cold and desolate places in outer space. Hawaii is perfect for exploring lava tubes and the composition of rocks. Just imagine the logistics behind going to both of these regions at the same time. This is where Iceland comes into play. It has diverse habitats that are relatively close to each other. So what exactly will future Mars-bound astronauts do in Iceland? To answer this question, let's travel back in time. Nevada wasn't the only place NASA's astronauts visited more than half a century ago. They prepared for walking on the surface of the moon in Iceland, too. Their primary objective was collecting rock samples. These can mainly be found near volcanoes and lava fields, and Iceland has plenty of those. Around 60% of the local landscape is rocky and rugged. This makes the island the size of Kentucky feel like another planet. Add that to the fact that 80% of Iceland is uninhabited, and you get the perfect playground for astronauts. And there's another similarity with Mars. In summer, it can seem as if the sun never sets in Iceland. Locals go shopping at 3 a.m. In June, for example, the night can last only two hours. Sounds like a perfect open-air party destination. Well, not really. Who would want a party at a freezing temperature of 42 degrees Fahrenheit? That's the average low air temperature in June. Future astronauts spent weeks in Iceland, trying to adjust to these strange conditions. This helps them prepare for the long days on Mars. This is not a figure of speech, since days on the red planet are longer than the ones on Earth by 40 minutes. That's not much, considering the length of days on other planets. On Jupiter, a day is over in just under 10 hours, while a day on Venus equals 243 Earth days. But let's first land on Mars and then think of other planets, shall we? Have you been doing some math in your head? If one day on Mars is 40 minutes longer than on Earth, then how long is a Martian year? Nope, I'm willing to bet your calculations aren't correct. You forgot to factor in an important detail. The planet is farther from the Sun than Earth. This means that a year on Mars lasts 687 days, nearly twice as long as a year on Earth. Sorry, future astronauts. You'll get a birthday cake once every two years. There's another minus to the red planet, literally. The planet's average temperature is minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Makes Iceland's climate feel like the tropics, huh? Despite these extreme weather conditions, scientists believe that water once flowed on Mars. And where there's water, there's life. That's why NASA scientists lowered the tiny rover in the middle of a crater that they suspected was once a lake. This is where it stands the greatest chance of finding evidence of life. What about life forms on Mars? Looks like it's not science fiction. The planet has polar caps like Earth. And that's not all. Scientists believe they've even detected snowfall on Mars. Its atmosphere is a hundred times thinner than that of our planet. It isn't a breath of fresh air, but it isn't extremely inhospitable like other planets. On Venus, it rains acid, and the temperature is high enough to melt lead. And on Jupiter, there are gigantic storms that rage on for centuries. Makes you fall in love with the blue planet all over again. Even Iceland sounds fun at this point. You might even want to learn Icelandic. If you're successful, then you can even read Old Norse, the language of the Vikings. And you'll know a hundred words for wind. This will come in handy as wind speeds on the island can reach up to 40 miles per hour. Out in the open, you have to hold on to a fence or a signpost to stay on your feet. Iceland's climate will make you think twice before moving there. But for astronauts preparing for another world, this place is perfect. Iceland is equally impressive underground. In fact, the island might hold the key to sustaining human life on Mars. The surface of this planet is not very hospitable. The soil is poisonous and abrasive. It can easily cut through an astronaut's suit. But underneath the ground, the living conditions are more tolerable. And Iceland has a real-life model of this potential underground dwelling. Lava tubes. Long tunnels carved out by lava making its way to the surface. These maze-like corridors are perfect human habitats. And they're cost-efficient. 
nature had already built them for us. Future astronauts can walk through similar lava tubes in Iceland. Who knows, one day their cautious steps might turn into giant leaps for mankind.